935 K Day Morning Show, Romeo, man, getting y'all ready for the weekend. But I got somebody in front of me right now that's part of this rap game in a major way. Soren Baker, how you doing today? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on, Romeo. Appreciate well, first this, of all, man. Appreciate it. Hey, it's all good. Just looking at the book, The History of Gangster Rap. Yes, sir. Yes, how sir. How long man. have you been a part of hip hop? Well, as a fan, uh, I'd say since about 10, but professionally, I got into it uh, writing when I was in college. So okay. when I was 18, I started writing about it. And then by 19, I started getting published nationally. So man. I've been in it for a minute, man. Okay, that's what's up. And I, I just saw recently a post on Instagram where you were talking about Ghetto Boys. Oh, yeah. You know, come on, man. Fifth Ward, I went to school U of H in Houston, so I okay. know about the Ghetto Boys. And I was just like, this dude. Yeah, yeah. Like, I have a whole... A uh, chapter, I mentioned them, of course, throughout the book, The History of Gangster Rap, but I have a chapter that focuses on the Ghetto Boys yeah. and what they went through. And then also, uh, as I do throughout the book with everything else, I have a lot of sidebars about rap a lot and their other artists. And of course, people out here in L.A., you know, they had C.J. Mack going as mad C.J. Mack. He mm -hmm. was on rap a lot back in the day. But I, I really go into what the Ghetto Boys brought to the game and Scarface in particular, of course. But yeah. You know, the Ghetto Boys, man, they, you know, I, I'm on their Unsung episode quite okay. a bit because uh, I'm a huge Ghetto Boys fan. And I talk about how um, they were the ones that made the violence impersonal. So mm. they, <clears throat> you know, before the Ghetto Boys, a lot of it, you know, was violence because of society or there was a specific anger but when you look at songs like mind of a lunatic yeah they're talking about killing because they're crazy not because somebody did anything to them they're just talking about it on a whole as they say grip it on that other level they're talking about the other <laughs> level of the game and um they just ratcheted up everything so so much yeah. that you know it was crazy and of course during this time the label gangster rap was new and they were they and a lot of the others, as I talk about in the book, and I have a sidebar about this, the label of gangster rap, yeah. the artists themselves, even to this day, a lot of them don't like that. So, you know, there's a sidebar. They don't like... The, the name gangster rap. Okay. So they like to be reality rap, street rap, street reporters, that type of thing. And the Ghetto Boys obviously fit into that because... I'm excited to talk about the Ghetto Boys. I can they tell. Have, they have so many political messages in yeah. their songs. And like Willie D on Do It Like a Geo is talking about how the East Coast wasn't playing their music. And this, this stuff is coming out in like 89. Yeah. So the crazy thing about it is this animosity and these type of things were going on way before the East Coast, West Coast. Willie D was talking about it on, on Ghetto Boys records on Grip It On That Other Level. And then the self-titled album that came out right after that. So man. it's crazy, and it's all in the book, man, The History of Gangster Rap. Front to back, you got to read it, and just the relationship that you have with this artist, what do you think it is about you as a person that these artists allow you to come into their life, that built that relationship? Yeah, I've been blessed to have that, man. I think it's because they can tell that I love the music. It's really okay. about the music for me. I've always studied the music. Um, you know, I was telling the RZA about this recently, and he, he had only knew one other person that did it this way, but I always kept my music chronologically. Okay. I didn't do it by artists or labels or anything. When I collected my albums, I put things in order so I knew who used the sample first, I knew where the, the pattern came first or all this other stuff and I could just go reference it like a library that way. And getting to be friends with a lot of the dudes, you know, Exhibit did the Ford for me, which was incredible. And then so many of the huge artists, Schooly D, Ice-T, MC Ren, D.O.C., you know, all these guys that gave me exclusive interviews, Big Trey D, all these guys know that I love the music and that's yeah. what it's about. And that's the thing that I think has enabled me to do it because when I, and this has happened to me with Dub C and many other artists, but when I sit down and talk to them, I'm not just talking to them about the single, I'm talking to them about the album cut and, you know, oh, you're Dub C, but you sampled salt and pepper on this, or, you know, chick on yeah. the side. Like, why did you do that? And he's like, oh, man, I love salt and pepper. So I know that they normally don't get those type of questions because right. I've seen other people interview. And if I'm sitting there watching two people interview someone ahead of me when I was earlier in my career and I saw them ask the same questions and I knew literally I was not going to I was not going to have asked them any of those questions. Right. I knew I was doing something right because that's when 
you know, LL Cool J would be like, yo, Soren, keep in touch with me. Here's my number. Or I get to be, you know, friends with Exhibit or Snoop and I are doing some pro uh, film project together. It's just all these different things that I realized that my love of the music and being able to talk to them in depth about what they do creatively and why they do it has enabled me to become friends with a lot of them, to be able to talk to them and like hang out with them. And, you know, they'll ask my opinion on things. Obviously, they Man. don't always listen. But, right, but you know, still, they it's ask. dope that they ask you. They're not gonna ask a lot of people that. Yeah, you know and what I mean? Like, I was, uh, you know, blessed because, you know, Schooly D is my favorite rapper ever. And, you know, getting to know him, he gave me an exclusive piece of art because he used to, like, I have on Gucci Time shirt for people yeah. that are, are, are looking. That was, you know, the B-side of his PSK single. But back then, Schooly D drew his uh, uh, single covers and the artwork for his albums, mm -hmm. like the Schooly D self-titled album and then the Saturday Night, the album he drew those covers so i asked him i was like yo man when i was interviewing him for the history of gangster rap book i asked him i was like do you have any artwork that from back in that era that you never published or whatever and he was like yeah and i said dude could i get a piece of that to put in my book he's like of course so wow. it was amazing that um you know i get i grew up you know trying to figure out growing up in maryland how could i get involved in rap and yeah because my parents loved me and supported me and their teachers so they didn't have any connections to entertainment or music or anything so i had to figure out how to do it and so writing what, but son breaker what was your passion that made you want to get into it to begin with like your passion for the hip-hop when you know you was a hip-hop head you when know? i was 10 man uh my friend gave me my friend tom early from elementary school gave me a tape and I was just mesmerized by it because I've been listening to the rock and my dad is really into the Beatles and things. And the Beatles, you know, are phenomenal. One of my favorite groups outside right. of rap. Yeah. Um, but when I heard rap, um, I didn't I didn't know early on, but I realized actually through my father indirectly why one of the reasons why I liked rap so much was that. He liked Bruce Springsteen, Born to Run, and I liked Bruce Springsteen, Born in the USA, because on the Born in the USA album, mm -hmm. it's percussion driven. So at this time in rap, in the early, mid 80s, it's all percussion almost. There's very little instrumentation in the music. It's okay. very skeletal, sonically. And that's what drew me to it was the percussion and the hard hitting drums and the 808s that Schooly D and Dr. Dre. So it was Dre. the sound before it's you actually sound. got into the lyric side of it. Well, it's both simultaneously. Okay, and I'll I take that. And scratching. I love the sound of scratching. And of course, in the 80s in particular, you know, all a lot of the music had a lot of scratching in it. Mm -hmm. And I just love the sound of that. And it was very different and distinctive. And then I love the way that the stuff was cut and pasted and put together to be on the record and they would sample different things and that's how you know i learned through raps how i learned about malcolm x and a okay. lot of different things so you know i remember talking to my dad about malcolm x and he's like you should wait a year or two before you read the autobiography <laughs> of malcolm x so you understand it better right. but i was you know 12 13 starting to hear him being sampled and mentioned in songs yeah and then you know like schooly d you know, was one of the guys that sampled him on Am I Black Enough For You album. Um, and that's why gangster rap, and it was so important for me to write the history of gangster rap because I think a lot of people look at the music as mindless. Mm -hmm. They just look at it on the surface level. They hear the profanity. They hear, if they want to say the misogyny, they hear the violence, but they don't, they don't really listen to what the artists are saying, especially the artists that I grew up you know, and fell in love with the Schooly D's early on, the Boogie Down Productions, the Just Ices. Okay, those, one, Boogie Down, you know, yeah, man. Ice-T and N.W.A. And, and all the guys, Compton's Most Wanted, DJ Quick, et cetera, they, they discard the fact that they're addressing societal ills. And, you know, N.W.A. obviously had F the Police, Compton's Most Wanted had one time, Gaffled them Up. So all these, Ice Cube had Who Got the Camera, all these records that are talking about police brutality and things were going on mm -hmm. then when the Rodney King incident happened and it sadly continues today we see all these examples of unarmed black men in particular getting uh, killed beaten harassed yeah all the above and other things by police officers but rap was talking about that before mainstream society talked about it big time they've been yeah. talking about it yeah and so 
when as a kid I knew that that was happening because I didn't grow up grow up in the ghetto or anything but I saw it growing up in between Baltimore and Washington like I saw and was experienced a plenty of craziness but to see what was going on in the newspaper and on television and then to hear it from the people who were the victims and were growing up around it perspective in an unfiltered way was mm-hmm. mesmerizing to me and it it added another dimension to it that later we see with Rodney King incident and what was being talked about and the rage and the anger and the frustration and the disappointment manifest itself in not only record but then in the riots and then in the acquittal and then and then and then and this continues you know ad nauseum today it's how but how do you feel about that i mean because you think about it we've been talking about it rappers were talking about it back in the 80s but now we kind of feel like we're still going through the same thing right so that's that's one of the disappointing things and um mc ren when I interviewed him for the book and he gave me an amazing interview and I have him throughout the book, you know, he talked about it too. Like there's always something going on in the streets. And the unfortunate thing that goes on in rap is that, and with the autobiography of Malcolm X, if you look at things that he was talking about in the book, I talk about in the history of gangster rap and the artists we're talking about that I write about in the history of gangster rap, many of those same problems are still happening today. Granted, things have changed in a lot of ways and things are better in a lot of ways, but a lot of people are still suffering. And oh, that's why man. that's why gangster rap and that's why these artists are so popular and so successful, because th- what they rap about and the stories they tell, the problems with gangs, the problems with racism, the problems with uh, societal inequity, all these things that are happening that have been happening since before the United States existed as a country obviously through slavery and through racism, et cetera, there's that, all that is a system and it's in place and it hasn't been eliminated. No. So yeah. that's what makes the music so powerful and did to me because when I, as I grew and as I read more and experienced more and I saw these type of atrocities happening in the United States and obviously around the world as well, it made me love and be passionate about the music even more and yeah. want to tell these stories and and get to know and understand and learn because you know i i grew up you know i wasn't rich by any means but i was fortunate i i had a my parents provided for me and i had a nice place to live and i didn't have to really worry about it you know we didn't have extra money but yeah. i never had to worry you about okay food. Yeah. yeah you were okay we didn't i didn't have to worry about if i was going to get a dinner or if the lights were going to get cut off so <clears throat> when i and i'm very fortunate for that but I also had friends that were on welfare that went to my school because my school had basically three demographics. So you had people in the projects, mm-hmm. you had people, you know, living in duplexes or apartments. You had me, my area, and then we had like rich people. So we had like a wide swath of <laughs> people. All in school. All yeah. in my school. So I saw it was just, it was a very intriguing experience as I've grown up and moved around the country and now living in Los Angeles. I've never been. I've never even seen a place that was like where I grew up in the sense that you had such a disparity all in the same school, racial, cultural, ethnic, and economic. And Mm. that really, I think, led me to, you know, have a lot of the perspective and the attitudes that I do and then led me to love rap because... Yeah, man. Yeah. And and it's right here in the book, The History of Gangster Rap. Soren Baker hanging out with Romeo this morning. Um, So... I, I love going back to this because obviously this puts you on your journey. You're 10, you're popping the tape. What's the first song you hear? That's the crazy thing. I don't know. I you don't can't remember. remember it? Because it was like <laughs> I got hit with the show uh, by Dougie Fresh and the yep. Fresh Crew and MC Ricky D. I got hit with uh, Nightmares by Dana Dane, Roxanne, Roxanne, UTFO, I Need a Beat by LL Cool J, Basketball, Curtis Blow. Um, I think he had put rappers to light and that's why I talked to him. I was like, Oh, what is this? You know, what, tell me yeah. more about this song. Cause I would hear it here and there. And I, I had heard the message before by Grandmaster Flash and featuring Melly Mel, which is still powerful today when I hear that record. Yeah. It's incredible. And all these records that I'm talking about, you know, Big Mouth by Houdini, you talk too much run DMC, all these records. I can't remember the sequence or anything. Cause mm. I never stopped the tape. I just listened to it all yeah. straight through and 
I was like, this is phenomenal, man. I mean, even for me, I remember growing up, uh, one of the first records I heard was Run DMC, Hard Times. Right. And I heard Rock Box. And I was like, yo, what is this, right? Right, right. So I fell in love with it. And I do think, you know, living in a world of fake news, you know, back in the day growing up, we listened to Public Enemy and Boogie Down Productions because we felt like we were getting the truth there. Absolutely. More so than the newspaper and on TV. And that's, that is a very important part of not only rap history and and you know i include a lot of that in the history of gangster rap but the thing that america is supposed to stand for is allowing everyone to speak mm -hmm. and well, gangster rap you know the artists that became gangster rappers are known as gangster rappers were like the second class citizens among the second class citizens because as you know you know in rap you know, being driven by New York, people would look down on artists if they were from Philly or Miami or Atlanta or the West Coast or the Bay Area. Quick to judge, yep. Chicago, et cetera. Man. So you had rap, which is being dismissed by music in general, even in black music being dismissed. Then you had of the successful rappers and the New York dudes that were running the game, you had all of them looking down on gangster rap. So yeah. now you have you know, the second class citizens of the second class citizens. So their voices and their anger, their rage, their frustration and their perspective became to me that much more powerful because they were tapping into something of wanting to be part of what was going on and they weren't. And, Got you. and not only were they upset about it, but they, you know, Ice Cube has an amazing song on his death certificate album called Us. Mm -hmm. And he addresses a lot of the societal problems but then he puts the the mirror up to the black community too and it's like if you're going to examine issues and you're going to talk about things it needs to be the full circle you know there needs to be accountability and there also needs to be change in the system and that's the thing that i think gangster rap really really more than any other genre of music and definitely more than any other genre of rap was you know an advocate for Couple more things before we roll out. Yes, sir. Biggie, Pac, you ever had a chance to chop it up with either one of these cats? Is anything about no, that? I was, in the I book? was too young. Uh, it was a combination of being too young and also being uh, not in the game enough. Okay. So I was interviewing by the time that both of them had been around. I got mm -hmm. to see Biggie in person in Baltimore perform. Okay. Uh, it was Biggie, Mob Deep, and World Renowned. They performed <laughs> at, at uh, Hammerjacks, one of my favorite clubs in Baltimore. And I got to see them, and um, that was amazing because there was only like 300 people. Yeah. And so I was literally one person in front of me and then the stage, and I got to see Biggie and Mob Deep. Had to be a dope that, moment for you. That yeah, was man. crazy. Um, so, and then I wrote about them, and then Tupac, by the time I started writing, he was, uh, by the time I started getting access to artists, he was incarcerated, okay. and then, um, and that's when the Me Against the World album came out. And then after he got out, you know, he's doing MTV and stuff, and I'm in college, and I'm, you know, trying to get in the game. Got gotcha. you. Yeah, they, okay. uh, they weren't like, hey, Soren, you want to interview Tupac? <laughs> no, but look at that, you wasn't now, <laughs> look that wasn't you happening. That wasn't happening just yet. If you had to, and this may be hard for you, man, because I love how you're so dedicated to the game, which explains why everyone wanted to chop it up with you about your book. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, you kind of remind me of the guy that produces the show with me, Manny. 21 years old, right? All right. The way he goes in, and he knows about back in the day raps, like he does his homework. Okay. And when I talk to you, I feel like this is the kind of guy that's going to carry that torch for you later because Absolutely, he's so dedicated man. to the game. He didn't know I was going down the road with this conversation, but that's just <laughs> what I see because right, I'm in right. here with him every day. Okay. So I admire that. But if you had to pick one of your greatest of all time, rapper and then group, Soren Baker, who would you have to go with, or is it just too hard? Well, um, it is very hard, and I think the greatest rapper of all time, in my opinion, is LL Cool J. Okay. And, Interesting. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot of things LL did first and did better, and, you know, I've had the privilege of being in a few of his recording sessions within the last year or two. Yeah. That are astounding. So you got a chance to see how he works. I, I mean, he had us rocking the bells. Mama said, knock yeah. you out. Then he can do a love song. I mean, well, you also have to, uh, you know, understand like with patterns and different things. Like other people get credit for it, but LL, like, you know, you've been waiting and debating for oh so long, just starving like Marvin for a Cool J song. He had the internal rhyme scheme going on before other people that got credit for it. Yeah. LL did that. LL had all kinds of things that he did before. He had. 
his most popular album has no profanity on it. Mama said, "Knock you out," which is crazy when you think about it. Mm -hmm. That album had four singles on it that, you know, were ridiculously sonically and thematically variant with Boomin' System, Around the Way Girl, Jingling Baby remix. And he Mama got, said, he got some bangers, out. so but he's your go-to guy for his favorite. Probably the best overall, rapper of all. Overall. And then, group wise, though, because, man. Group. You got NWA, you got Wu Tang. Now, the challenge with NWA is, of course, they only had the uh, two studio albums and an EP. Right. So, very uh, short. They, in my opinion, could have and would have and likely would have been the best, but I'd have to say most likely it's Outcast. Outcast is the best. They, um, Every album, and even on Aquemini, they had the Return of the G song that kicked off that album, talking about, you know, gangster stuff. But they obviously approached things from the Southern Atlanta perspective. But sonically, thematically, um, conceptually, they're astonishing. And people, if you really go listen to what they did mm -hmm. in particular, up through, well, even including the Isle Wild soundtrack, I mean... People slept on that and didn't look at it really as an Outcast album. They looked at it as a soundtrack, but it's essentially an Outcast album. Yeah, all that stuff is phenomenal, and um, I love on the Quimini the title track they shouted out MC Ren. So Outcast is not a gangster rap group or anything, but they are so deep into it and obviously are influenced by gangster rap that they included and wove that into what they did in a way that was very distinctive and just their chemistry and everything and the the challenge is you know with especially with gangster rap groups and now we don't have as many groups mm -hmm. and that's that's also another thing that's disappointing but above the law i think is one of the best rap groups of all time see i was going to ask you that so you pick ll which obviously that's east yeah outcast south which i thought you may have said ghetto boys maybe because you had that well the such ghetto a connection. boys in the history of gangster rap I break it down. The Ghetto Boys, this is a little known fact. Okay. I, I break Give me it that down. Fact. I break it down in the book. The Ghetto Boys never had the same lineup on an album, ever. Mm -hmm. So every album, like one album has Big Mike, one album Bushwick's not on, one album Scarface isn't on. So Willie D left. So it's hard to say that it was it was more of a collection of artists and it was a group mm -hmm. and obviously Scarface, Willie D, and Bushwick are the core of the Ghetto Boys, but none of them were on every Ghetto Boys album. Interesting. And I that's, mean, that's I, I did not know that all the way through. <laughs> I did not know that. Okay. Well, it's in the history of gangster rap. There you go. So, that's why you got to pick this book. That's up. right. That's right, man. So we got Outcast for the South, LL for the East. Give me one for the West. Who's the best well, like in the I, West for you? Pimp? Well, let's go. Let's just talk about Above the Law for a minute because okay. they in my opinion, are one of the best rap groups of all time, and they're also very underrated obviously for you know, to creating G Funk and getting that sound out there. Yeah. Starting with the vocally pimping EP that came out in ninety one, uh, for the funk of it and how they use samples because, you know, with the vocally pimping Black Mafia Life album, which came out right after that, and then the chronic, you know, I talk about this and Yuckmouth gave me a great quote, is that, you know, with NWA, Ice Cube and, you know, Compton's Most Wanted doesn't fit into this, but DJ Quick does to some degree, is basically those artists, their music was very fast, aggressive, angry, confrontational. And then above the law, Dr. Dre, and obviously later Warren G, they slowed it down and made it funky. Yeah, they did. They and when they, they that. did that, they were doing it, you know, EPMD had done it before, MC Breed, of course, Ain't No Future in Your Front, and the X-Clan, all these different artists had used funk but mm -hmm. they used it in a different way. Even Dr. Dre throughout Ruthless Records and even on NWA, you know, that he used the same Parliament Funkadelic type of samples, but he was using it more funky, aggressive, fast. Yeah, he flipped, yeah. Whereas Above the Law slowed it down. And Yuckmouth has a great passage in the book about that. And then, so I think Above the Law was so amazing because they brought the Black Mafia also aesthetic to the game if you go back and look at living like hustlers their first album which you know Laylaw, dr dre above the law all worked on you know in, in different levels but the point is they created a new aesthetic of the black gangster a sophisticated gangster wearing suits they were on mm -hmm. the cigarette boats in their videos and and they brought something that was amazing and sonically and thematically they helped 
change with G Funk. They helped change the sound of the music. And Dr. Okay. Dre obviously put the super stamp on it and made it, you know, yeah. what everyone knows. And then Warren G branded it and made it his thing by name. But Above the Law, man, if you go back and listen to the, I'd say the first four Above the Law albums, including the Vocally Pimpin' EP, like that stuff is phenomenal from the concepts. You know, they're talking about, um, and this is one of the other things that's great about gangster rap and Above the Law does this too, mm-hmm. is like they talk about the downfalls of things. You know, Ice-T does a great job of this too throughout his career. You're talking about getting arrested. You know, your mother's on crack. This person got shot. You know, your uncle's, you know, smoking crack and just stole your sofa. Yeah. You know, it's not glorifying it. And and Project Pat's another guy from the South who did, you know, this. It's showing all sides of the story. Compton's Most Wanted is great at this. DJ Quick is great at this. Above the Law is phenomenal at this. That's what makes the guys that you're naming what makes them so epic because the story they tell, they bring it to yeah. life. All right, man, you got to pick up the book, The History of Gangsta Rap, Soren Baker, hanging out with me. But you know what? I love picking your brain. Best thank diss you, record you, ever. You. We got Ether, we got No Vaseline, we got Hit Em Up. If you had to pick one, best diss rap ever. I got to say, it's, it's got to be No Vaseline, man. That that song, whew, that's a tough one. I that's, mean, he had to take down the whole squad with that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's that's a that's a very powerful record, man. Yeah. And, um, I remember listening to it um, and just thinking, like, I, I don't know how you can respond to that. Like, it's just... You can't. I it's, mean... It's, it's bad, You got to be like, he got me. Like, all right. And... <laughs> but there's so many, so many great ones. And the thing that was great about that one, well... You could argue a different, so I won't say that. But you can. It's, it's just it's just an amazing record that really showed um, the thing about that era of music that was so amazing to me is that it was driven by being the best rapper, yeah, being the best lyricist, being the most skilled. It wasn't dissing for dissing's sake. It was dissing to destroy them. And you know, obviously, with rap history, it's a competitive sport. It's a contact sport. So yeah. back in the days, you know, when you had Kumo D and Busy B battling, Kumo D was trying to end Busy B's career. Yeah, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to diss you. It was like, nah, dog, I'm trying to take your spot and destroy you. And that is, you know, rap is super competitive uh, when it's, in my opinion, done at its highest levels. And that's the whole thing. You want to be the best. Yeah. Well, and apparently you are the best in this game, though. <laughs> well, you know what I'm you, saying? You. you are the best at what you do. The history of gangster rap. Make sure y'all pick this up. Thank Yo, you. Yo, man, you, you got to come back again. Don't chop it up. I mean, I we 90s to, hip-hop. You, you educating a lot of people. Hey, man, let's do it. I'm For here. For sure, man. Skate it morning show. Roll me up.